Okay. There. Okay. So there's Troy. Um, so Ripple uh, was Troy's idea in many forms. So um, why, why is the Troy here? Uh, he's been at every BoostCon so far. Apparently, um, someone in the, the group that he works in died, and so the proverbial you know what hit the fan, and it's been like that for two months for him, and he's just totally buried. So he can't be here, and he hasn't been able to do any work on Ripple actually since I I picked it up in this. Um, but he's been he's been working on uh, ideas for sort of streamlining boost development and fix it, making our infrastructure workable for um, years and years, actually. I mean, like a, a, a boost steam make effort started, I don't know, two years ago, something like that? Or that was first BoostCon. The first BoostCon, okay. Longer, I guess that's four years? Yeah. Three years. Three years, okay, so it's it's been a while. And, and you know, uh, it never, it never got through the sort of the neck of the bottle that, that it needs to get through to finally be something that we're using. So, um, uh, so anyway, uh, let's talk a little bit about why we're doing this. Who knows what that what that is up there? Super Guppy. Yeah, Super Guppy. And what what do they do with the Super Guppy? Fly big super frogs fly big stuff around. Yeah. Well, specifically the yeah the shuttle booster stages. They, they built this to, to do that. I learned all about the Super Guppy this, this summer from because I was out visiting my brother-in-law, who's a big um, uh, uh, plane aficionado, and we went to all these airplane museums. Anyway, they build this, they take a, a regular airplane, and they build this shell around it, and, and then they cut away the, the outer hull. Um, anyway, this is sort of a metaphor for the way I feel about what it's like uh, at the moment to work with boots. Um, I mean, we've had these complaints for for a long time. They've been running through the the sort of ether of the community for a long time. That you know, the thing is getting a little bit too big. Um, it's the barriers to entry are are too high. Uh, the tools are you know slowing us down. They're, we're using things that are sort of nobody else uses, and these things end up. Um, Making it difficult for users to get into the into the system, it makes it hard for for packagers because we we have like like the fact that we don't do regular point releases it really screws up the Linux Linux packagers. There's just a whole bunch of kind of uh, ways in which we're off in our own little world, and it and it makes it hard for the rest of the community to to work with us. Um, <coughs> in any case, um, anybody anybody want to add anything to this list? By the way, um, I, I like the etc. Sorry, I like the etc. The etc. Yeah, there's a lot of etc. Here, um, we're trying to do too many things. Is one of my favorite complaints. I mean, the fact that we're we're in build tools and we're in uh, we're in documentation tools and all that stuff. You know, I, you know, I have mixed feelings about all of those things. That in fact, the boost build project was my baby initially. Um, I think it's long since outlived its uh, its benefits, um, but um, but uh, anyway. So I think we've done a lot of cool things, but it's not it's not what Boost was about. Um, in any case, this is you know this is me now. This is what happens to me about doing Boost development and participating in Boost because of the basically the mental drag of knowing that we've got these things just kind of in an unworkable state. And they've been that, that way that's felt unworkable to me for years. Now maybe it's not, you know, maybe it's actually working fine in, ge in general for most people. I'm just telling you, like, this is my personal itch, right? I want, I want Boost development to be exciting and fun for me. And right now, it's not because, there's, because it's just too much of a, you know, drag. too much of a big drag, a big aircraft carrier that you have to you know, spend two days turning around. Um, so, uh, <laughs> all right, so this is sort of a metaphor for what I wanted to be like, what it was like for me when, when we started. Uh, you know, uh, lightweight, uh, small, small projects, uh, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was pretty easy to operate. And so I want to, I want to, make all that stuff possible again. 
Okay, so part of that is uh, making sure that, that the whole thing isn't monolithic and you're not, you're not really tied to the, uh, you know, your fate as a library developer isn't totally tied to the fate of the, the uh, to the way the other libraries are working at this moment. Um, uh, I want to I make development go quickly so that I'm not slowed down by, you know, the tools. So I want that to be fast. And I also, I want to use cool technology. I want to use technology that makes me excited about, about doing the work. Um, and, uh, but specifically, I don't want it to be my technology. I don't want it to be Boost's technology only, you know. So I want to get most of the technology from others. Um, now, I don't know, I'm just going to make this, this claim sort of without, without any proof or, or support. Um, I, I think that decoupling strengthens community. And, I, and I, these pictures, for some reason for me, they really they gave me the, the feeling, of, the understanding of how that works. I don't know if it communicates to you. I'm not going to say that much more about it. But, um, but I think that we'll have a lot more people participating if, uh, if everything feels a lot lighter weight. If it's not so imposing. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, what's Ripple? This is so we've we've come at the problems with Boost from, you know, at least two different angles. Maybe I think Robert had had two different angles in his talk, and then Joaquin had another one. So maybe we had three different angles here. This is another cut at it. I'm not I'm not claiming I'm solving all of the problems. Um, this uh, this addresses just a, a piece of the the situation. Um, but one that's been bothering me for a long time. So, um, what is Ripple? Essentially, you can think of it as a package manager. Um, uh, you all are probably familiar with one of these these technologies. Um, these things actually exist for Windows. There's, those last two are, are Windows ones, even though they're not heavily in the culture of Windows development. <coughs> um, so, their package managers are all over. Um, but uh, unlike some package managers that are that are about distributing binaries. Um, there are, are very few that are based on distributing source and building the source and doing the installation that way. Um, so, by the way, my ideas about this have, have evolved as I started to get a hold of the other technology that I'm using. So this being entirely source-based is no longer really a requirement. But this is where I want to start, um, because this is what's important to Boost developers. Booth developers gotta work with source. Um, okay. Uh, uh, so also cross-platform. Obviously, most of these are, are very specific to um, you know either Linux or or Windows or Mac OS. One of those things. Um, uh, and also, what I wanted to do was to was to make a sort of a uniform um, environment for doing development and installation. Because what I know happens very often uh, in the open source world, especially with me, is I'll, I'll get some piece of software from somewhere, and it looks really good, and I start using it, and then I realize something needs to be fixed. And then the question is, all right, am I going to now set up a whole new repository for it? And ha how am I going to interface with the author <coughs> of the library or the, or the component? How am I going to get that stuff um, uh, submitted back upstream? Um, uh, so, uh, so I wanted to make it sort of more uniform, for, so that the continuum between users and developers was was a little less um, abrupt uh, the transition, and that makes it also uh, an entry path for contribution in the sense that that all right. So not only do you submit patches up, upstream, but um, since I want to lower lower boundaries, lower barriers to entry. Um, you know, I want to make it easy for anybody to have a Ripple project. Um, so, Ripple is not is not Boost. Uh, can I? So, uh, first question I have about this is, what who's the primary audience? Boost developers or Boost users? Neither. So it's both. The the open source community is the primary audience. So the, uh, in this case, the source base is uh, kind of a run short of some uh, libraries uh, built. Sorry? Well, so the number of libraries are, quite, uh, are built, so if you want to deliver it to the user environment, you definitely have to deliver it to the binary. 
only if you assume that your users don't have um, don't have providers, right? So if we're if we're talking about you know things like boost libraries, if we're talking about libraries, then presumably your users have to have compilers anyway. Now there are a class of there are a class of libraries that get delivered for users for use it at, in purely binary form, and that was not my if you want to say who's the primary audience, those guys were not in my primary audience considerations at the beginning. It turns out that as we go on, you'll see that that's, that's actually pretty easily supported, um, but that, that's not where I was aiming. I was mostly aiming at people who were developers. What, what about um, the documentation generation? Is, is it considered to be source? Or if I want to get a package with a major pre-generated or not pre-generated with original sources, even that we have two forms of Details. All right. I'm, uh, I haven't got. I haven't got everything worked out yet. And uh, and those. I think that may vary from package to package. How that all works. We'll see. Um, yeah. I think I might be missing something. I'm wondering what is different than what you're saying here. And any revision control system is distributed, like any modern distributed revision control system. Um, well, you need. So one thing. A, a distributed revision control system doesn't have a notion of packages, doesn't have a notion of version interdependency between these things. So there's a whole layer of stuff that package managers do that version control systems do don't do, and likewise the, the other way around. So this, you know, one of the things we want to do here is to unify them, make that a smoother kind of combination. Um, okay. One more question. Yeah. About enter entry process configuration. Uh, do you want to simplify the entry as much as possible? Me? Oh, uh, does it mean uh, is it all I have to do I say, oh, I want to have a library. Just go to the boost. You know, I want a new library named ABC. You know, so we, we create a new repository for the library. And then Wait until I get to the workflows part when we, when we can talk about the details of how those kind of things work. No, just, I have, I have I'm a not sure how good it is in general. I know. I'm not sure how good it is either. I, I know. So let's let's go along and see what we find out. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So uh, some technologies that that I'm currently using. I'm, I'm not. By the way, I'm not attached to any any particular background technology. If somebody knows that you know there's something that fits this job much better. Let's just do it. Um, you know, it's it's not that big a deal. I haven't invested that much in it, although, yeah, it has been a lot of work in the last few weeks. Um, okay, so actually this is the thing that has taken most of my time. Um, so there's a, basically this is from the, the uh, Python distribution community. So how many people here have used Easy Install? Okay, so um, Easy Install works pretty well. It's, it's a Python package management system. Uh, it's pretty old. Uh, Basically, you install the script, and then you can say "easy install," um, you know, package name, and it'll pull down the package and all of its dependencies, and you know, compile them as Python does. And if there are extension modules, it'll build those and, and install it. Okay, um, and that's that's really old, crufty code um, at this point. So the Python community, there's actually quite a vibrant development community that is that is working on, you know, what's it really supposed to be. Um, and uh, so uh, pip is sort of the, the next version of easy install, as it currently is. Um, and uh, so what do we get from pip? Um, well, one thing, so there's, there's other code boards like distribute, just utils too that you'll, you'll also see is distinct from pip, but let's just put it all under the pip umbrella. Um, so what do we get from it? One thing is that Python actually has a fairly rigorous peer review process for, um, for things that are going to be official. Uh, they call them PEPs, uh, Python Enhancement Proposals. And they go through a whole you know, peer review thing, and the, you know, there's a paper, and eventually it gets signed off on by and it becomes official and all that. And so they, they've done a lot of thinking about the general problem of package installation. And um, the problem that the problems that they have to deal with in the Python community, especially if you consider the fact that there are things that actually do get compiled by C and C++ compilers, are not 
that different from the kinds of problems that we're going to face as um, C++ developers. Um, <clears throat> so they've solved a lot of problems. Like when I say project metadata, I mean like um, describing you know who who's the author, who are the maintainers, what are their email addresses, what versions of other packages does this package depend on. Um, that last one is the one that has the most sort of impact on uh, on tools, um, but especially if you want to do some of the things that, that Robert was talking about last night, you want to have all of that metadata available. And so they have, they figured out what the standard format should be. They figured out a lot of stuff. So that's one thing that we get for free, not having to repeat that work again. Um, there's an idea of what a, of a project index and what is the format for that. It's actually a very simple thing. And they're, you know, they're currently have one. It's the same um, project index that you use with easy install, it's called PyPy. And, um, and so, you know, I just set up a project index for, for my purpose um, things myself. Uh, it's very simple, uh, web pages, basically. Um, so, uh, capabilities, so you can download prepackaged versions. So this is um, uh, like pre-built things, so you don't have to do um, install from source. Uh, if don't want to. That's not, again, that's not what I wanted to focus on initially with Ripple, but that capability is right there in the in the code. I mean, you could like use it with Ripple. Um, pulling uh, revisions out of version control systems, um, uh, that's, uh, that's something that they have, although I did have to extend it a little bit, um, but they're, they're already hooked into all of these other version control systems. So right now, I'm going to tell you you're going to see in a minute. I'm, I'm very, you know, I'm very hot about Git, uh, about Git, and that's what I'm basing my work on. But it's nice to know that you know they've got an abstraction layer over all of these things, and you could, you know, in all, for all intents and purposes, bring in a project that uses Subversion too. Um, that's what you want to do. Um, okay, I already talked about the development community. Um, yes. All the packages. It means that all all the packages include the dependencies. Yeah, yeah. It follows dependencies. It, follows, it, it resolves version numbers, all that stuff. Um, all the good stuff you know that needs to happen. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. So, um, how many people in here are Git users already? How many people have never touched Git and don't really understand it? Okay, most. Of you. Okay. Um, all right. How how many people don't know what a distributed reversion, revision revision process? <laughs> okay, most people seem to. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, so basically, um, it turns everything inside out. Right? You, you stick a, a local repository that's represented in your file system inside of the, the working tree. Um, that's that's not particularly interesting. It it makes some things nice, um, uh, and the workflow is generally you know you. You'll make changes and you'll commit them to your local repository, and so you can build up some working history. And then, uh, if you want to make them available to the public, you can push them out to a remote repository that you have right access to, or you can pull in changes from other people's um, remote repositories. Uh, if, uh, and uh, the thing that for me was sort of well, a number of things compelling about Git, but one of the most of the uh, most compelling things is that it's this um, content addressable store for files, directories, and revisions. Um, and what that means, what I mean by content addressable is, right, it, it basically does a checksum of the, of the object, whatever it is, and that's its identity. Okay. So when, uh, when a commit links to its parent commit, or parent commits, um, it's recording the checksum of those things. And it's done in a cryptographically secure way, so it's like almost impossible that you would ever have a hash loop. Okay, um, <laughs> and that leads to a lot of nice things, like that if you push some files, <coughs> revisions, whatever, out to somebody else's repository, that is the same object, and then when you pull it back from the repository, you already have it, and the system is absolutely knows that. So that makes merging changes and that kind of collaboration. Uh, really nice um, because uh, Git doesn't even have to ask the question about you know whether these two things have changes in common. It does. 
uh, it knows that. Um, plus, it's also got additional really uh, good smarts about how to do merging. So that's so that makes it really powerful. Uh, huh? Have a good merge, good graphical merge. Uh, there are lots of lots of external tools. Um, whether they're good or not, uh, as far as graphical tools, I I like to use a tool that I have based in Emacs. It gives me the most control, so I haven't really investigated the, okay. the graphical ones. Um, but there are a lot out there. Um, another point about Git that's not on the slide. Um, so why am, why did I hook into Git? For me, I I got the sense it really appears to have the momentum. Um, there are a bunch of dis distributed version control systems out there. This is the one that I think seems to be catching on. It seems to be gathering the most support. Um, okay. Um, and then another another feature that's very important to me as somebody, um, you know, a very important part of what we do at Boost is sort of getting the rationale for what we're doing out there, making the um, making the ideas clear, uh, making the public record clear. Uh, so one of the really cool things about Git is that. It, there's a lot of very flexible ways to, to rewrite your revision history. So you can commit a bunch of things and then decide, well, these two things really should have been one commit because I was just correcting that other commit and then build a new uh, commit chain really easily. So all of those kinds of things spoke to my desire to present the logic of the project in the way that, um, in the way that I think about it as opposed to the you know, niggling implementation details that I went through to actually get things to compile. Uh, so, uh, because we've been uh, working with it a lot, and, and you know, this is where Troy started, we have CMake. Um, uh, so, why CMake? Uh, it has a lot of capabilities built in. And, uh, we have David Cole from Kidware here who's going to uh, talk a little bit about CMake specifically because I'm not an expert in it. And he is, um, so. I can't tell you everything, but I know that there's a lot of built-in things that you get with CMake. Uh, for example, like building installers is, you know, it's right there in the system already. So if you want to distribute uh, Windows installers or, or installers for any platform, uh, they're really easy to come up with. Uh, <coughs> the, the features and the support for CMake are not driven by us. Okay? So this is a very important distinction between CMake and uh, Boost Build for me. Uh, you know, the, we're going to be continue, if we use CMake, we're going to continue to get the benefits that accrue into that project without having to be asking for them ourselves and uh, looking for them ourselves. So they're, they come from elsewhere. Um, so, and for those who needed the two second introduction, um, it uses an architecture that's a lot more like uh, what people are used to on, on Unix platforms where they, um, configure uh, make make install type process. So that when you invoke CMake, what that's actually doing is essentially the configure step. Probes your system, figures out what tools you have, all of that stuff, and then it doesn't repeat that work every time you build like Boost Build does. Um, and it's it's really um, fast and responsive. I don't know if it's because it's not doing the, con the configure work each time. That's what makes it much faster, but I know that it starts building right away. Like how are CMakes built? Half second. Sorry? What, how are CMake files made? What's uh, the CMake maker? I'll let, I'll let David uh, speak to that later. Okay. I mean, they're, they're text files. Um, like so you can write them in a text editor. There may be other ways to make them. But I'm going to leave that to him. It's Sorry? Generic targets. Whatever you want. Visual Studio files, you make files. I'm going to leave that for David Cole because I'm, I'm not an expert on that. I want, when he gets, when we get to his section, he'll answer all those questions. Okay. Um, <coughs> okay. Um, so uh, the only thing I have left in this presentation is to talk about some of the workflows I've envisioned for you know how this system would get used. Um, so before I move into that section, if there are any questions about what we've done so far. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. This technology seems to be missing something on the website. Something that will how we present uh, projects. 
if you have a project with separate history, separate version, it should have separate web. Yeah, so, so one interesting uh, feature is that the, um, the index format actually ends up having a web page for each project in the, the index of projects, right? So, so uh, that would give us a place to hook into for actually presenting the project, but we don't have to put it there. That's, um, that's another layer that I, you know, I consider to be sort of an orthogonal question. Right? So um, with, with, the, with the tool, you know, you can say there, there's all kinds of things like, you know, uh, search for libraries with this keyword, search for packages that, you know, have this in their name, those kinds of things. Uh, and so that's the, that's the command line facing interface. And we can talk about other interfaces too. There's, there's plenty of directions to go in, in terms of expanding. So. That we use tracking integration and all that? Sorry? Who's use tracking? Uh, not, uh, not specifically. That's right. Um, interestingly, there have been some, some really interesting projects uh, working on, on actually doing the issues tracking right in a Git repository. Um, and I think those are great ideas, but they're totally immature at this point and not, um, not ready for public consumption. So, but there are a billion issues tracker systems out there. And, you know, we can talk about whether, I'll actually have that on a later slide, we can talk about whether we're going to stick with the track that we have, whether we're going to break into an issue tracker for each, each project. Those kinds of things are, are related but orthogonal. One of the things that, that the thing I'm proposing does is give us a lot of options for what we can do. Right now, we don't have that many. Okay, so <clears throat> we're close. Um, so, um, you know, uh, this, this comes from uh, when I was sure that I was absolutely going to require Git. Now, if we're going to if we're going to uh, allow people to um, download prepackaged uh, gzip files, which the the infrastructure that I've got already, you know, lets you do, um, then this sort of thing wouldn't be necessary in general. Um, but my, you know, the slide's there to say this should be dead easy to use, and um, and I want to make sure that you know people don't have to spend a lot of time figuring figuring out how to set up tools in the background to use it. <coughs> All right. Um, so you want to install some projects. Um, you know, this stuff is. This stuff is pretty no-brainer, um, but uh, I think that we can uh, that we can make a lot of this stuff just work very simply. Um, and this is this is basically inspired by Robert's talk. Um, I I wouldn't go as far as you know trying to mandate that people run the tests, but I think a strong encouragement like this is a is a great idea. Um, you know, if you know what you're doing and you're and you know you're willing to take the risk of running the code untested, great. Take note. Uh, you are obviously to describe command line interfaces, but uh, mm -hmm. there are two obvious alternatives. One is web, one is non command line interfaces. Mm -hmm. So, is this if land is considered? Or? Uh, the, uh, basically, basically, no. I'm not saying that they're that they're off the table. Those are much more complicated programming projects, and I want to make something that's you know usable quickly, and we're basically you know, all comfortable with doing some command lines. So this is this is a package system initially directed at developers, remember. Um, so uh, users. For users, what? Well, you expect that the uh, person coming from uh, Windows, so something usual for the web developer. Yeah, okay, so look at it this way. From the point of view of a boost user, I say this is a big improvement, okay? so. Um, so it's a big step forward for the Boost user as it is today. If Windows users need something more, well, you can think about putting a GUI over it, like you get a Sigwin package manager GUI or whatever it is that you like. There are lots of ways to do that. But um, <coughs> that's, not, that's not where I'm starting. I've got to start with a uh, sort of limited uh, I wrote all the goal. tools for 2003 all the way through 2010. Um, you wrote all the tools? I wrote all those tools to take the the information about the dependency tree using CMake that makes solutions and projects for Visual Studio and the IDE and did all the GUI stuff. That's all been done. 
and I can actually make those tools available to you. Um, but the question is, how do you determine the uh, dependency tree for the project? I mean, let's say I want to bring in the graphics library. I, I've got to bring in a bunch of other libraries. Yeah. That's so how do I do that? Okay, so um, I, can, I can actually show you small demos, but there, uh, the, uh, the PIP project, the Python development, whatever thing, has already defined uh, a <coughs> metadata format. So there's a file that you put in a .ripple directory at the top of your project called metadata at the moment. Um, and it describes, you know, I depend on this, I require this distribution and that distribution and this other one, and, you know, with whatever version constraints there are. And the system pulls those files down. And you have uh, to do that for every, every project? Mm -hmm. That's how else would you do it? Is it a that's how you oh, we have a global file. You have a global file. Yeah, we have. Yeah, so well. so I'm not. No, so yeah, no, so right. one of the things that I don't want in this system is too much global anything. No, uh, I get it. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that's not the best. But that's what we do. How does this work? Suppose I ask if you check the and then I say I can show you the one. Okay, and, and and then I say and um, get me. Say that I already had one of the dependencies from a previous version of Boost. Mm -hmm. So how does it manage, you know, the versions given that I might already have parts of Boost installed, and then a later project that I try to download requires a later dependency on one of the projects? Uh, I'm just curious. What you're well, I so a I have to say I haven't I haven't explored those scenarios like all the comp complicated corners of those scenarios, number one. Number two, I, th I think the answers in most of those cases are fairly obvious. It's like you, you only have a certain number of choices and there's certain kinds of um, conflicts that you know can't be resolved without user help and at that point you have to tell them. Um, these things are, are, uh, are known issues and in fact the PIP system already has to handle those things. Uh, so I'm assuming that uh, at the moment, their handling of it is, I, I will tell you, is crude, um, but there's a big you know, to-do marker in their code. So either we're gonna fix the bug for them uh, quickly or somebody else is gonna get to it. Uh, but it's, I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's a big mystery how to deal with those kinds of issues. Every package management, management system has to do it. One tiny little thing. It just kind of sticks in my brain from the very beginning. What, what What's the significance of RYPPL? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Troy and I were trying to come up with, with names. And um, I think names were just flying about. And, and uh, oh, yeah, yeah, now I remember. Now I remember. Okay, so so it's from our, you know where the name Boost came from, right? No. You don't? Ah. ah so uh, the, the name Boost um, came from. So it was uh, Sophia Antipoli uh, is, was, um, it's actually, what's the, is, is Doug here? No. What does what what Matt Marcus call Sophia Antipoli? Probably soccer dress. I soccer dress, right, <laughs> right. It's the, so, it's, so there's this place where, where the ISO C++ meetings have been a few times, which is like this really, it should be a beautiful place. It's on the southern coast of France, but it, it ends up being really bad place for the meeting isolated from everything, and, and uh, anyway, so they call it isophagus. Anyway, the first meeting after, after um, approval of the standard, the 98 standard, was in Sophia Antipoli, and um, you know, at the first meeting after the approval of the standard, you know you're not supposed to do any invention, you pretty much don't have, you don't have a lot of bug reports, so there was a lot of sort of standing around, and you know, there wasn't as much to do as normal, so uh, this is where, uh, Bean and Dawes was uh, starting to think about uh, starting to think about where these new libraries were going to come from, thinking about Boost, but didn't have a name for it. I was talking to Robert Clarer, and they were talking about the the hype that had come along behind Java and how and how you know there was you know all this coolness associated with the Coffee Association, and, and somebody said you know Boost is better than Java, and somehow that turned into Boost. So, <laughs> so, 
Well, Ripple is some like really cheap booze. And, <laughs> and that was what I think what brought it, but it's not spelled that way, but the, that's what brought it to, to Troy's mind. And um, we never came up with anything catchier, and so there it is. That's the <laughs> okay. Um, <coughs> all right, moving forward with, with to workflows. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of obvious things you can do with this command line interface to make it uh, not tedious. You know, if you want to say, run the test for sure, then and don't ask me. You could do something like that. And you can obviously, you know, have a configuration file in your home directory that says, you know, my default is, is never run the test or whatever. So, uh, if not, <coughs> that's not rocket science. Um, okay, so you want to get a project. Um, so this would bring uh, this, uh, smart pointer the Boost Smart Pointer project down into your current Ripple workspace. If you don't have a Ripple workspace, I guess it establishes one in the in the directory you're currently in. What's a Ripple workspace? It's just a place where where um, the different projects have been uh, downloaded to. So um, <coughs> that's where you're going to be working with source and uh, building and installing from. Um, okay, want to start a new project? Uh, there's a project. So that makes a local project. Um, uh, now, you want to get your project out to the world? It doesn't have to be much more complicated than that, so then it'll, it could give you some instructions. All right, now, uh, if you haven't been using Git, then you, then you probably don't appreciate what this is like, but, the, but there's a, there are at least two major uh, foundries that are supplying you know, as many pretty much as many free Git repositories as you want. And so one of the things I didn't want to do was, was require this system to do really any hosting, um, maybe beyond just having the, the package index. And, uh, and so what that means is you know, it's trivial to get uh, a public Git repository on GitHub or Gitorious. And um, this, they even have APIs so the system could be smart about it. You know, setting some things up for you, um, but at the very least, you know, we can give some instructions for getting it set up, and then have it send the project up to the public repository. <coughs> um, uh, yeah, right. So another another thing, just sort of a convention for Ripple would be, you know, you don't have to mention the project if you're inside it for most of the commands. Um, so right. So if you're using some other project that's um, you know somebody else developed, then there's the question of what's the best way to make a, a public copy of their project that your team has built, and so the system can help you do that. Um, okay. So uh, next step up. This is so you've made some changes to this other project, and you want to you want to get them out to the. <coughs> To help you with that. There's a lot of stuff that we could make uniform that just, um, there's no reason for it to be different for every single project in the world. Uh, Something just changed here? Okay. Okay. <coughs> Local testing, Ripple test. Give it the projects you want it to test. Okay, so this assumes they may or may not be on your machine. <coughs> Robert was asking for us to run it, but I had already considered, so we're on the same page already. Um, uh, you want to test the project and test all of its dependencies. There's a deep flight. Um, remote testing. So this is a, an important feature of the system. Without, without this sort of um, capability, we wouldn't be able to do Boost, and I want Ripple to be able to support Boost. Um, so, uh, so you can request remote testing for your project, and what's it going to do? Well, there's there's uh, there's sort of a, a two-way uh, uh, protocol for figuring out where these tests are going to get run. For one thing, so everybody gets their own repository and, and is able to get their own sort of um, 
private write permission on the repository and grant it carefully. So, so for the person administering a slaving machine that is volunteering to do some testing, they can say specifically what repositories they're willing to test changes. Okay, so that's that's one layer of control. Another thing is that um, you know in your own project configuration you can say something about which test slaves you're um, you're willing to have your code tested. Uh, and then you know you can be more specific about specific places you want to have it tested. Yeah. So how does this match just with the current system? So the current is building everything everywhere. Right. Yeah. Um, so all right, so this is remember that this is not boost. Okay. So what what does boost want to do? Well boost itself or if we're if we're doing a distribution of vetted boost packages where all the versions of the projects in the in the boost package are supposed to work together, obviously boost is gonna to wanna to also have a test. And their test is gonna to wanna to test everything. And uh, separate boost S S uh, as an organization if you want to have separate budget uh, somewhere. Yeah, okay, so um, yeah, so there would be a separate uh, Git repository that is Boost, but no, you don't have to duplicate all these projects in Boost. There's some a neat feature in Git called submodules, and the submodule is this essentially points to a repository and revision um, to check out from that repository. So, so Boost, um, one way to formulate it is it's a collection of these subprojects, and the um, Release managers of Boost, it's their job to decide which which version of those things to each of these things is pointing at. We can talk a little bit more about the Boost um, <coughs> workflow in a minute because uh, I do have slides about it. Okay, uh, another, another thing that I'd like to have in the system, this is not probably a, a version 0.9 feature, but um, uh, so the, some notion of release criteria, and that responds to our, sorry, releasability criteria. And that corresponds to our uh, markup, our XML markup currently that says, well, we expect these failures here, and we expect those failures there. Right now, it's very kind of semantically wishy-washy what that actually means. And I want to nail that down and say, this is, this is what it means for this uh, uh, project to be releasable. It has to work, you know, has to pass all tests on these three platforms, and it's allowed to fail this one test on this other platform, and that's what we care about in terms of being able to release it. Uh, so uh, initially, you know, maybe we can adopt the XML format that, that we currently have for that. Um, it's not a complicated um, uh, sort of question, I, I think. Um, further questions? That's, that's about all I have for workflows um, at the moment. And you know, I was very pressed for time in terms of making slides, so I, I thought through a lot more stuff than I've been able to show you. But it, so if you have questions about workflows, how things would work, ask them now or ask them later. <laughs> um, so, yeah. At my company, I actually support all of these things graphically. Mm -hmm. okay. And all of that stuff is directly translatable to what you're doing. Exactly, it's just like a week project to translate everything to what you're doing. Great. Well, let's so see. Let's see I how we can reuse your work. I hardly believe that I'm actually going to be able to make an easy boost contribution. <laughs> that would be great. That would be great. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to talking to you about that stuff. So Dave, this, yeah. this is maybe a, a kind of a detailed scenario, but I'll put it in your brain so you can yeah, think okay. about it. Um, it goes to the issue of the library dependencies. and um, As you're well aware, it's sort of not as obvious as it might seem. So my favorite example, of course, is if you were to say, I want to look at the date-time library. Uh, well, date-time supports serialization, but I don't know what percentage. Not everybody uses serialization. Right. If you just did a header dependency analysis, you would decide that you, know, you need to download serialization and build it and all that when you wouldn't need it for most users. You know, you know, you know this is such a great thing. I, I, I'm sort of just researching the PIP documentation, and they've already covered these kind of scenarios. Super. It's like they have, you know, uh, features, optional features. And, okay, right. And so you can control what gets pulled down. Right, because so, we made a long, a long time ago, right, we made the decision that 
serialization would be supported in the different libraries. You know, if you were providing serialization right. capability, so I think it was the right one. But anyway, that would be like a feature then that you would be yeah. able to. Yeah, cool. So, um, so like I said, there's a lot that we that we can get for free just by piggybacking on on other people's work. Um, Sorry? How do you define dependency for my For? I'm starting a project back at so I want to say I'm dependent on date time, version 1.3. Right, you, you write a metadata file. I can show you, I can show you an example. Um, uh, let's see. There is no command that you can send to the new page text file. First cut? Yeah. Um, uh, I mean, if you don't need to see it, then I'll just, I'll just not uh, slow things down. Yeah. Um, um, but well-defined format, so, uh, and it's documented already. Ed will add it to his GUI. Huh? Ed will add it to his okay. GUI. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, all right. So, so we start taking all this stuff out of Boost. What's left for Boost? Well, um, uh, reviews. I mean, Boost is, that's one of our main things, and that's not going to be taken away by changing this kind of packaging technology. Um, so vetting certification is basically the same thing. And so you have sort of two levels, right? It's whether you're letting a, a library in. And you know, if you want to have a third level, uh, uh, you have uh, candidate. So that that's what we came up with, right? Well, last night. Actually, I actually, my proposal changed it from one level to two levels, so I'm yeah. not sure where we got three there. Well, this third level is, you, oh, okay. is certifying the release. Okay, so we have a cert besides certification of libraries, we're, we, we have the certification of a release, yeah. and my proposal was to, say, uh, <coughs> define the concept of a candidate library. Right. And, okay. So that's, so that's an, uh, another thing that, you know, that's a subcategory of individual yeah. library certification. Um, and, uh, and that's a decision for Boost to make. That's not that's not tied into you know, uh, uh, So you know we're going to continue to develop best practices. We've got the BoostCon, so we've got the community. Um, uh, and so I don't think it I don't think it threatens Boost's identity as a as a entity. Um, yeah. Well, certification. Um, so if we, let's say in candidate libraries or certification. It seems to be that we might want to add something like vector compile stable library versus library. Uh, already, already in uh, yeah. So as part of the metadata format is classifying well, all of these things that we want, like classifying what development stage is in. Pre-alpha, they've already got all of these uh, categories predefined and a way to represent them. So, so yeah, I agree with you. But yeah, you we have support here. It's stable. What does it mean in practice? Record in text file. Well, Boost can decide that you mean something specifically. Ripple is so. One of the things I want to do is I want to increase activity at the margins. Okay, it's there's no there's no continuum of participation from from somebody who's just hacking off in a corner to getting into a, a Boost library. It's a big a big jump that you have to get over. So I. So that's why, for me, it's important to have Ripple open to everybody. Um, it should be like CCAM. You should have millions and millions of selections to choose from and, and ratings, you know, so that we can read them out and decide what, you know, like, like Robert was talking about, so we can decide what actually uh, is worth using. <clears throat> yeah? Uh, just a question about how this works. Can you have, can you say this actually works with my prerequisites version library that you said will actually work and build against a number of releases? Yeah. Yeah, there's all kinds of ways to represent those. And, um, you know, if we find, so another so the thing here is like I've, I've established a good working relationship with those guys in the PIP community, and if we find that we have needs, representational needs, it's very likely that we can get those to be implemented and accepted upstream because they'll want to they all have the same problems. Um, I don't think there's anything C++ specific about this kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking, I feel that still there's some contradictory forces about the uh, 
uh, initial submission. We just had a proposal, let's make this more difficult, let's require more. And yesterday was sort of let's uh, acquire more data, more information, more set up from higher entry point. And he just, again, just uh, tell, you know, tell us that we want to make it as simple as possible, like sit down and uh, and, uh, Yeah, so, so the question is, where does Boost start? So, so people have been talking about raising the bar a little bit for what it takes to get into the At the same time we're doing that, I want to lower the bar for what it takes to get into the continuum of development that turns into Boost. So that's what Ripple is. So what do we call that greater C++ Boost candidate? Hopefully the candidates would ripple into Boost. Isn't that the idea? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, oh right, yeah, I, I have to say this is part, another part of Troy's vision for, for this was to make make all of those sandbox projects, which some of which are gotten to be really useful in, but maybe somebody hasn't been able to get them through review, usable, integratable as easily with any other Boost library as you want if you're a user who chooses to you know step outside of Boost certification and use a, a candidate. Yeah. Oh, I was puzzled. Um, I, I saw some gentlemen uh, describing uh, um, Debug visualizer for things like SharePoint or multi-index and stuff. Okay. Um, those aren't libraries. What? They are not libraries. They're not actually reviewable kinds of things that you put out. Are they? they are reviewable. Yeah. I mean, they're. Well, what's, I mean, what's not a library? I mean, well, I mean something for the main. A, data, a debug visualizer. <laughs> Something that goes into Visual Studio so you can see the Why is that not a library? It's a text file. Just it's like a tool. Yeah, it's, it's just a source. source file, right? It's, it's program code, right? It's a piece of text. Yeah. yeah. So, is your, so is your C++ Like any program. other compilation yeah. unit. All right, all right. <laughs> I think, I, no, I get it. I, I don't know. I, I'm, but it is a I'm not convinced I have answers to everything, but that seems like a reasonable way to look at this. So, um, yeah? Okay, the last point. You said you want to allow. Is this is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the last point you just made. <laughs> you just want to say you want to allow libraries to depend on libraries in development. Will it be acquired for aggregate releases? Will it all participants of aggregate release do not have dependency? Not certified. Not certified for it. Yeah. No, I wasn't going to say that a, a certified boost library could depend on anything that wasn't certified. No, definitely not. Um, what I wanted to say is that there are users out there who've been like watching the development of something that's a, you know, somebody intends for Boost someday, but you know it's not in Boost yet. And right now we have this completely disorganized sandbox, which you know, yeah, like, like integrating something from the sandbox with what you're using with regular Boost is pretty much impossible. Yeah. And I mean, it can be done, but it's a pain. It's really painful. So I want to make all that uniform for, for people that choose to. Um, okay. uh, what? Let's see. It's almost 9:30. How's everybody doing? Would, would you guys be able to stay? Anybody need to leave before a half hour is up? Because I want to make sure we have enough time to listen to David talk about CMA. Okay, great. Um, uh, so, uh, so what's not in Boost? Um, well, I know I want to move move stuff out of Boost. In the few minutes I had to bring up this slide, this is the one thing I was absolutely sure about, was that, that we could get um, a bunch of tools development out of, out of Boost. Um, if there's other things that, that are leaving Boost by doing this, I don't know what they are yet. Anybody has ideas? You just said that even the debug or can be an library. Why not the tools? Sure, it can be, so Boost itself can decide what its mission is. So maybe this, maybe this should have gone on the next slide too. The next slide is what's optional, okay? So a lot of, a lot of stuff becomes optional for, for Boost, all right, that we haven't really considered to be an optional for getting rid of, an option for getting rid of. We have a lot of choices now available to us if we start looking in this direction. Do we need to have a single website? Like, you know, if you look at, at GitHub, for example, um, every every repository on GitHub <coughs> has a whole bunch of facilities that just come along with it. An issue tracker, it's not the greatest issue tracker, but um, so you get a whole bunch of stuff for free. Web pages, 
you know, maybe we're asking people to host their own web page. I don't know. Uh, do we have one monolithic mailing list? I don't think so. I think we. I don't think that scales anymore. And you know, it's part of the reason that I'm not uh, posting on the list very much because uh, I don't have time to read the whole thing, and it's just too imposing. Uh, the monolithic issue tracker. I think track is. You know, it, it's a great system, but it's also uh, getting kind of slow. We've got a lot of projects uh, depending on this one. This one track, and actually. I know that the development of track is actually stagnating, so um, so that's another thing that we might want to uh, consider. Uh, are we going to host services? Like right now, we host a repository, a subversion repository. That one thing can go away. What other things do we want to be in that in that business, or do we want to offload those to free, publicly available um, uh, people that you know it's their job to do that? A lot of options. Um, so that that's the last slide I have. Um, if there are any burning questions before I bring up David Cole, ask them now. Otherwise, uh, I'd like to continue after. Yeah. Just to be clear, you, the beginning you wanted to have, like, you want to use all these other people's tools where possible, but you're writing this tool. Right. So yeah, I was going to ask, so what is Ripple then exactly? Right. Uh, you Ripple? know, So you've got PIP, you've got Git, and then you've got this other thing that you've been hacking. Okay. So uh, Ripple is trying what is to be Ripple a then? tiny layer on top of it. Um, as much as possible, I'm contributing bug fixes upstream, um, uh, features that they, features that, that we need needed or things they obviously want. Um, so I think that they're going to accept them. One of the, the biggest drags for me, actually, that, that caused the most sleepless nights was Windows portability, um, which their developers, for some reason, Actually, the, the main code base wasn't that bad. It was the tests that were not portable to Windows at all. So me and actually, this is another guy, uh, Francesco. I cannot pronounce his, pronounce his last name off the top of my head. He's an Italian guy who contributed a bunch of the, um, the test porting also. So we worked together on that, just so you know. I haven't been on this totally alone. Um, uh, so my, my idea is Ripple is an extremely thin layer on top of these other things. Uh, I I want to just you know steal as much as possible. So your Ripple Do command it. is it a Python script? Is it a yeah. C plus so, plus program? Okay, so pip, pip is Python, right? Yeah. Pip is written in Python. Yeah. So it yeah, is not. Ripple right now is in Python. Okay. I'm not attached, like I said, to any technology. Sure. Sure. But this is an accessible way for me to get. Yeah. I'm just trying to understand what, what what exactly is we got. Oh, we're talking about. Well, I'm, I want to mention this because I you know in some environments like. For example, over at Kitware, if it was up to them, they probably would not want to be adopting something like Ripple because it depends on Python. So some people care about those things. If we have a better alternative that really that really makes it. Oh, the CMake lot. also. Sorry. Sorry. So so there's CMake, CMake as well. So pip, CMake. Yeah. Uh, so so now that so Git. Um, the de the strength of the dependencies, I would say, go in this order. Um, I would say uh, uh, pip. And so Python and pip is sort of the, the one that we're kind of most tied to because we're getting the most functionality from there. Uh, Git would be next. Um, uh, but there are a bunch of other version control systems out there that right. can support this kind of workflow fairly well. Um, and then CMake would, I, unfortunately, in some sense, I, want to, I would really like to simplify the world and say, you know, there's a good reason why everybody has to do the same thing. But right now I can't see uh, a reason that we need to absolutely legislate CMake. One thing I do know is that parallel builds over large, uh, large uh, collections of dependent, interdependent things will go faster if we can use CMake because CMake will make them into one big uh, build graph and be able to, you know, do the parallelism more efficiently than if you, you know, just know that there's a, a BGM process somewhere that you can call your CMake thing. And Get that one big model. Uh, yeah, Eric. So if um, if Ripple is just a tiny layer on top of a pip, and Ripple is generally useful, what are the chances we can just push it all up into pip? All of it, maybe. Um, I, you know, I. That's one of the things I'm uh, I'm seeing is certainly there's no reason that this that this has to be owned by Boost in, at all, and I really I really hope what I. You know, 
I'm surprised to have an idea that I think can do this, but I think this can actually change open source development significantly. I don't think, you know, I don't think it's going to be first shattering, but I think it might be something that a lot of people would want to adopt because it brings together a bunch of a bunch of things that. Um, well, I don't want to. I don't want to get the the justification. So that would be great for me if if it could get picked up, and if it did, then it would you know have a life of its own. I mean, have you floated that idea on the pit to the pit developers? It's, it's premature for that, um, right? So we're we're still in a pre-alpha stage. I don't. I certainly don't want to ask them to contemplate committing to okay, to sure. adopting a system that they you know they're still learning about me, you know. So well, they don't know you yet, is that? So, but I can, but I can tell you that they're that they're very uh, receptive to accepting the patches of stream that I've already submitted. So they're going to take all the Windows portability stuff away. Yeah. Uh, so what I don't see here, so a lot of a lot of the problems, quote unquote, that I, well, from from a sideline perspective, looking at it from the outside, is there isn't really a boost organization. So I, I think I I mean I don't see it right now. So there are there are maintainers, right? I see the maintainers. Um, I'm sorry. There are you, I need to ask you. Okay. Do you mean when you say there isn't a boost organization, do you mean there isn't one now or there isn't one in the proposal? So so what I'm getting what I'm trying to get at Can you is clarify that question for me. Um, so I don't see one here in and, the proposal and in the and in the other one. So from Robert, uh, I wasn't able to catch Joachim's talk. So. Okay. Uh, I don't know, but I think a lot of these things are policy issues, mm -hmm. right? And as far as, as a matter of, I, the way I understand policy is it, it only works if you have an organization to apply it on. So I think uh, tools are great. I mean, the technical challenges can be solved by technical solutions, but I think there's another side to it that, that might need some attention. Absolutely. So, I mean, one of, see, see what, what I'm saying here is that these things, uh, I'm, I'm hoping that by taking the burden of, of this stuff out of Boost itself, that'll give Boost a lot more freedom to, to explore with respect to policy ideas. So we'll be able to make policy choices more freely and with less, less sense of like, oh, what's this going to do to the rest of the world? Right. You know, right now that's the way it feels like. You know, any policy decision better get it absolutely right the first time, or it's going to screw everybody up. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, I want to try to get that out of our air as much as possible. Right. So I think I I'm just looking for a, another discussion too on on the other side of things mm -hmm. because I think all all this stuff is cool, right? Mm -hmm. But then the not so cool part is like the big elephant in the room. Well, yeah. So I mean, it may be. I don't know why I think this gives us more freedom. I don't know why, but I do. Okay. If, it, it, if that's the case, if I'm right, then it may be that we need to we need to get through this before we before we have the freedom to think about what our policy changes should be, or at least get through accepting that we're going to you know be able to rely on something like this. I um, think if I might be so bold as to to ask this gentleman's question maybe in a little different way. I've been associated with Boost, in, I don't know, six, seven years, and uh, and follow it pretty closely, whatever. And and, and I don't, I'm not really asking for an answer, but I've just wanted to state that I've never understood how any Boost policy is arrived at. And uh, <laughs> it's, frankly, it hasn't concerned me because I've been able to work with it. And, you know, I don't really like to get involved in stuff that's controversial. <laughs> you say that now. So anyway, I, 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 think that, I think this gentleman's question is: it's, we don't really know where policy comes from. My denim would say, "Up, you know." I frankly, I haven't never cared, so I don't know if that's helpful. Can I answer that, Dave? I mean, I I I think the policies come out of the community, and I mean, I think it's pretty consistently been that way. Can somebody get me a drink of water? For Thanks. years and years. I mean, so, you know, it's the community that makes the policies, and we've had a lot of things that haven't changed very much in a long time. You know, we do reviews. We 
you know, have ways of doing reviews. We have the, all those policies. You can go to the policies page and read all about it, right? I mean, it's it's right there on the website. It's not a mystery. Now, if you want to talk about, you know, policies with respect to release procedures and so forth, some of those things have been evolving, no doubt. Testing procedures, those have been evolving. But not fast enough, I think, is why well, you're well, developing. I, I, I kind of don't want to go spend too much time on this. Yeah. I don't think it's important. I realize that policies exist. I just really never knew where they came from, and as I say, since I felt I could live with them, I didn't care, and I just moved on. Well, so, yeah. all right, let me, let me give you this, the quick answer. And um, I, as I say, the I'm, quick I'm answer not is, for an answer. So. Well, uh, it's a pretty quick answer. The, so, policies, quote, come from consensus, all right? Ultimately, you know, you've got to have somebody able to make final decisions, so the moderators do that. Um, if there's, you know, if there's controversy where it's a really tough thing. But in general, we try to we try to follow the practice that a lot of us have learned through participating in the C++ committee, which is looking for approving the consensus that's already in the room or the consensus that's already in the group. And so you try to you try to hear what that is and and um, make that the policy. Yeah. Paul, there are two related questions. First, is, what is the timeline? Second, do you or Please, please, I do need help. Um, um, I, I want, I do want to make sure that we get a chance to hear from David, but, um, but these are all important questions. So, uh, so essentially, I put aside all of my other responsibilities other than to my family um, for the last, I don't know, three weeks or something like that to work on this, and I've been, you know, actually a lot of nights not sleeping. Um, so I've been putting in a lot of time, and after after BoostCon, I'm not going to be able to work at that same level on this anymore. But I've got a lot of the, the basic substrate problems solved now, so it's a good time for other people to come in. And yes, I do need help, um, and you know, and I am hoping to recruit some help from the Boost community um, with the with the uh, an eye towards making sure that this project ultimately is not owned by Boost. I don't want this to be a Boost thing. Um, so uh, so I'll be looking for help from elsewhere too. And I actually do have, there's been quite a, a, a little surge of interest from people that are outside um, Boost altogether. So where, where does it live now? Ah, um, it lives in, well, you know, distributed version control <laughs> makes that pretty nebulous. It, it, lives, in, it lives in Git repositories um, and I can, <coughs> Point you at them, and there's Ripple.org has a bunch of documentation on it. A lot of stuff is in, you know, semi-formed state. We have a, we like, oh, so I should tell you, Troy already did the work of splitting up Boost into into separate modules and figure out what putting out their dependencies. Now Ed says that he also does that. Maybe he will have a better cut at it. But you know, we we already have modularized Boost with each library in a separate Git repository. Um, so there's a bunch of work that's been done. Troy figured out how to get that whole thing to build under Steamake, and and you know, so we have all of that. Uh, some things changed in the structure, so that stuff doesn't work exactly now, and so there needs to be some adaptation. But there's a lot of there's a lot of meat already on the bones. Um, uh, other questions? Can we move to Steamake? Yeah, um, ready now. Did. Right. Right. So my name is uh, my name is David Cole. I'm the top one on the list here um, from Kitware in Clifton Park, New York. Um, how many of you guys have used CMake? Does everybody know what it? I mean, besides here last year. Besides here last year. Bill Hoffman is my boss, uh, and like Dave was saying, he threw his slides together. He had you know just a little bit of time to spend on this. I I was asked to do this about two weeks ago when Bill found out that he couldn't come. So. Uh, Rough, rough slides, but I think we'll get through it. Um, so CMake has been around for about 10 years now, and the guys who started it, uh, you know, their original goal was to give uh, C++, like the compile portability that Boost gives to libraries, if that makes sense. So Boost aims to have this set of libraries for C++ that's usable everywhere and compiles everywhere wherever there's a C++ compiler. CMake aims to uh, 
generate native build system files for Make Systems, Visual Studio, Xcode, uh, KDevelop, Eclipse, all these things, uh, so that you can compile that C++ code everywhere easily as well. Okay, so <coughs> the real reason that I am here today uh, is to pledge support from Kitware to support Boost. All right. We have <coughs> several customers and clients that use Boost already, and they want to see it easier to build Boost everywhere using CMake. Uh, so Kitware, as a company, is pledging to support Boost with at least one man month over the next year, and that's not the mythical kind either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so it's really only one man month then. <laughs> be the one man. I'm not sure. We're, we're, we're still working that out. Um, but that's uh, that, that, that one pledge came from one of our clients. Okay, And uh, they're already paying us. We, we have a contract with them to do some other work. Uh, but they said that we could take you know, one man month's worth of that uh, effort and devote it to helping get CMake build better, or build, boost build better with CMake. All right, so take the boost CMake effort that Troy has been fostering for these last three years doesn't seem like it's possible that's three years already. Um, and make it official, okay? Uh, in addition to that, you know, it's, it's very likely that we will uh, be able to offer additional effort over that one man month. Um, especially given that we have uh, these clients that have direct interests in building boosts with CMake. And uh, there's also, uh, so some of the other uh, one of, one of the features that uh, we have significant interest in in other projects, not even related to Boost, um, is this notion of incremental testing, where you change you know, a header file, and you only want to rerun tests that are affected by that header file change. Uh, that, that overlaps with uh, some other projects that we're working on that you know, it'll, it'll blend in nicely with this work. So uh, Kitware as a company, uh, we, we have been around since 1998. Uh, there's some information on the screen here, some, some basic stats, but the, the one thing that I want to point out, we're, we're primarily focused on uh, scientific computing, and all of the projects and all of the clients and contracts that we get, uh, they all relate to some sort of scientific computing. And at the heart of every single one of those is a CMake-based build system. Okay, They started the company in 1998, Within the first two years, they came up with this idea to start CMake to enable cross-platform building of the libraries. And uh, it really started with uh, the visualization toolkit and uh, the ITK uh, image segmentation and registration toolkit used in medical imaging applications. And uh, over the years, though, everything that we do is based on CMake. And so it's, it's, it's really in our interest to uh, to make sure that CMake is as widely adopted as possible. Uh, this is just a list of uh, some of the projects that use CMake already, and some of our clients and supporters uh, who have sponsored this work over the years. And one, one of the goals you know, that we have is to get rid of this little qualification. This slide has been shown in a bunch of CMake slideshows for the last couple of years. And we, we'd like to see that uh, boost Get officially, yes. I was curious, what, what's what been the difficulty in getting boost <coughs> under CMake up till now, or how how far are we from that, do you know? That is my question to all of you. <laughs> I, I, so, can, I can speak to some of those issues. Um, yeah, it's, as far as I'm, as far as I'm aware, I mean, I'm not, uh, I, I've not been involved in all of the details of what's happened over the last few years with respect to boost and CMake. Uh, but as far as I'm aware, there's no real solid technical issues. It's just well, a matter so of... The incremental testing was the big one. Okay. All right. So this is a, a core part of our development um, process is being able to make some changes and, and rerun tests, but not rerun everything um, because that would just be insane. So uh, so most, most projects that do, that are set up for this kind of System testing. <clears throat> Don't do that. If you look at, if you look at, well, they have 
they have a testing system that's all hooked in with CMake. So there's C test and C dash and CMake all working together. So that didn't do it. Build but also is not set up to be in incremental. Um, uh, for the other ones, uh, I'm sorry, I should know more off the top of my head. But basically, they're all sort of like, we're going to all test in, this, in the suite. Um, and, and we need something else. So that's one of the things their clients are, are asking for that now. And so it's going to get paid for anyway. And they want to uh, make sure that it serves us too. Right. Yes. So the uh, CMake, uh, well, I was talking exclusively about build system. I will also refer to like uh, test something or test uh, or everything with the reporting system. Is uh, this all going to be combined into something? Uh, that's okay. So that's up to you guys, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, you know, we'll use whatever tool makes sense. But uh, but right now, there's, there's no technology out there that's going to do that's going to do the incremental testing for us out of the box. Um, and so when they do it, I think it's going to be kind of a no-brainer that we'll, we'll pick up their their tool for it. Um. You mentioned C test. Um, the C dash, C make, and C test all have uh, direct funding sources within Kitware. So Kitware is, you know, we, we make most of our money on contracts and grants that we apply for with uh, various groups and other companies and national labs and research organizations. And uh, you know, the the funding that we have for those three tools are, uh, we, we have basically funding for three or four full-time developers, you know, for the next two years sort of thing. Um, and, and beyond that, you know, we'll get, we'll get more contracts as time goes on. Uh, but also, as CMake is at the heart of all these other projects that we are, uh, that, 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 we, that we do, uh, indirect funding is also available. So when other projects need additional features in CMake or CTest, you know, we work closely with these guys, you know, the 70 people that are at Kitware now. Um, so when they need something, they give us, you know, a piece of their, a piece of their pie to fund, to fund that effort. And using, using CMake, you know, there's a huge community of uh, CMake users uh, from all those, all those other projects that are already using CMake. So our specific objectives for uh, becoming more involved with uh, building Boost, you know, let's get rid of that experimentally on the prior slide, right? Let's make sure that it's uh, official now. And do be specific. <coughs> the second bullet item here about enabling incremental testing is the specific one that we're going to be working on first to uh, try and get it so that when you change just a couple of files, you just re run the tests that are necessary. And then there's this. Uh, this new notion of uh, a cloud-based testing system using C dash and Git. Um, we this is something that's like at the very raw prototype kind of stages right now. Um, we've just transitioned CMake itself and Paraview and BTK to be hosted on Git repositories within the last two months, and uh, so everybody at Kitware is kind of getting a crash course on uh, using Git. And one of the things that we see that uh, uh, enabling for us moving forward is uh, people being able to contribute things to the open source code bases through GitHub or Gitorious repositories where they can point us at a commit or a branch that they've made in their own repository. And then we can say to our C dash server, hey, go pull from that repository and then distribute uh, jobs basically to uh, some, some client volunteer computers out there on the internet, have them do the build and test suite for us and verify that this commit from this guy uh, passes all of our tests. And uh, using technology like that, we're, uh, we're confident that we'll be able to accept patches from sources that we wouldn't have considered before or wouldn't have even been aware of. Um, of course, you know, stuff that just gets lost in the uh, noise on the mailing list. We have the same problem on our mailing list. We have the volume of the CMake mailing list is getting to be uh, high enough that one person can't keep track of it all anymore. Um, 
Yes. I have one question that's kind of is a mystery to me when right now. And if I have my own little project and I make a make file mm -hmm. and I fill in the thing and make the dependencies and part of the uh, and it's and I make all it, it makes all my tests and it only makes only remakes that stuff which is necessary. In other words, it seems to how is that is that not incremental? How is it how is it that we don't have incremental testing? When it seems like I have it with just a simple make file, what's the what am I missing here? Um, well, so the way that you describe tests to CMake, um, there's no notion of a dependency between a test and the source code that goes into it. Right. The, the thing that's missing is not is not something that uh, the thing that's missing is just. Uh, code in CMake. We have to write some new code that recognizes that these tests come from certain source files. I mean, I mean, let's let's just, let me help to clarify that yeah. a little bit. Okay, so see, uh, so so you don't want to make my question. I think no. I understand okay. why you're having your question. All right, because I asked him the same question. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, um, so, uh, so CMake is it, it has one similarity to to BGM in that there's the there's the sort of um, low-level engine dependency analysis language interpreter thing, mm -hmm. and then there's a, a language on top, and, and they've got a bunch of stuff written in that language. So so the stuff right now that does testing um, is just not tied into working with targets in that way. And so they're rebuilding, when they say writing new CMake code, they don't mean having to write new C code, but you know, CMake's written in C. They don't have to write new C code to, to support it. They're just Restructuring that library stuff so that they use. It. So they're kind of inserting a notion of a target that didn't exist before. Or something yeah. So with, <coughs> basically, uh, CMake build targets are libraries and executables, or you can define custom targets. Um, it's actually it's on the next slide. The. Uh, well, I think it answers my question. I mean, I, I was I was just missing a little piece. And right. So to to do a test at build time right now, if you type make, if you type make test. What it does is it runs uh, our other tool, ctest, which scans, uh, it, it basically runs all of your tests. It doesn't have any kind of discriminate, discri it doesn't have any kind of input to it that tells it what changed to uh, enable this incrementalism. So right now, you can do build time incremental testing, but you have to use this add custom command instead of our add test command, and you have to use an implicit depends option it only works with make file generators, and what it does is it scans the C source files for pound includes, basically. Um, so that all works, but you have to do so, you, you have to do stuff differently and not the normal way of adding tests in a CMake project. So what we're going to do is we're going to extend that capability to work a with non make file generators, so it works with Visual Studio as well, um, and to make that dependency and incremental stuff work at test time in addition to build time. I shouldn't say instead of at build time, but in addition to build time. Yes? So my understanding of the way um, the, the current system is going to work is the project dependency information mm -hmm. is in project metadata, yeah. right? Or Ripple. Well, that's, that's for Ripple. Well, uh, it's in the project metadata. This is the, this is the Ripple. Level thing. Yeah. Ripple, ripple level thing. So, how do you get that information to the CMake? Uh, or we could do this any number of ways. Okay. That hasn't been, the, the details haven't all been sorted out. Oh, that's right. It doesn't look like a challenge. No, I To me. Yeah, so, uh, other. Uh, Recent work that we've done. That I'm sorry. Let, let me just say one other thing about that. Troy already solved that problem. It's just that the, the things have now restructured slightly, so his solution doesn't quite work, but it can be adjusted. So, in other words, it's quite doable, and the concepts have improved. But but there is a one source. Is, I guess that was the essence of my question. Yeah. I, what, There's one source for that information. Yeah. For that information. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Sure. Um, the most Relevant feature probably is this, this bottom one here um, in CMake 2.8 or C test version 2.8. Uh, we added parallel testing capability. Uh, there's also ways that you can express dependencies between tests so that you can say this test has to run first before that one, uh, so that things can run properly in parallel. 
um, you know, tests have to be written such that they're independent of other tests so that they can run in parallel. Uh, but that, uh, that's in C test 2.8 right now. Um, so if you have a project that has a thousand tests and you run, you know, C test minus J8, it runs eight times faster if, you know, as long as there's no contention for anything. Um, as long as you have eight cores. Eight cores, I think. Yeah. eight times faster. Um, so there's also uh, the notion of subprojects in C dash, um, where th this this will this may or may not prove useful in Boost with its uh, you know its modularization and its submodules approach. Um, uh, it should. And then there's uh, an external project module that we also added to CMake 28, which uh, is again it's one of these attempts at uh, you know trying to. Uh, enable people to build things that they depend on before they build their own stuff. So it, it's a way of pulling from repositories and third db files up on the web, building from source. Um, using other build systems. Using, yeah, use, and you can customize it so that you can uh, specify what the configuration command is, what the build command is, what the install command is. Um, and there, uh, I wrote an article about that for our, our newsletter last year if, uh, if you want to look any of that stuff up. Um, why, why should anybody consider using CMake? Um, we found this quote on the, on the web from a couple years ago. Uh, this guy converted over to CMake from, from AutoTools and put up his own performance analysis. And uh, you know, I'm not going to say that this will happen with every project that's converted from AutoTools, but uh, we, we do have a significant performance advantage a lot of times. Yeah, just maybe I'm just unclear. Are we talking about? Porting Boost to CMake or porting Boost to a combination of CMake, CTest, and C Dash. Uh, any number, of, yeah. Any, 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 yes, whatever yes. you guys want. Yeah. <laughs> um, we would love to see you guys adopt all three of them, but uh, we're we're going to use whatever you know. Yeah. Ultimately, from from a Boost working with Ripple perspective, we're going to use whatever technology we can get our hands on that that works for us. Yeah. And, and, the, and these guys have a big interest in making sure that their technology does work for us. So, I, you know, I, I'm willing to bet on that a little bit. Okay. Everybody else is using it. <laughs> <laughs> Would you jump off the Brooklyn Bridge if you're friends? So. <laughs> I mean, I can scratch this experimentally on this. Um, so this is uh, just a quick glance at a C-dash page for a project that is doing sub-projects. The Trellinos package is, uh, has got something like 45 or 50 sub-projects that they have, and uh, there's a way to express the dependencies among these sub-projects as well. And uh, if you click on one of these, you can see, uh, you, you basically see uh, a blow up of, this is a, like a summary row for the day of all the builds that came in. If you click on them, you can see, you can dig into details for each of those. Uh, another C dash slide. Kit where hosted C dash. So basically, the main reason I'm here is just to say, you know, Kitware is pledging our support to uh, get this incremental testing stuff working in the very near future with C, C test and CMake. Um, but there is still more work to do, and we need your input. And uh, that's my email address. Any other questions? Uh, yeah. Just much as C dash based. Uh, we have our own C dash. Server. Oh sure, yeah. C dash is an open source thing. You can put it on any web server that's running, uh, you know, Apache and MySQL, basically. It takes about 15 minutes to set it up. It's utterly trivial to get the dash up and running. Yep. But frankly, there's uh, those people will host it for us, and why should we host our own? You know, they, you know, they they've got to, they have to be able to host well and host quickly, and their business depends on it, and you know, just take a lot of burden off our, our shoulders and they're willing to take the the uh, limitations and arsenal ads off of the off of the free hosting that we get. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, yes, I'm 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 quite puzzled, frankly. Um, okay, so on Linux I use GCC make on on Windows I use, you know, maybe seven one compiler and on Macintosh I use different compiler. And, and I've got, you know, literally a hundred different dependencies which are different on every platform on, right? How do you, if, how do you make a builds file 
which is the same on every one of them. Do you actually specify those parameters in a? In sure, a so if, if there's difference in like your configure input on on Mac okay, versus. Okay, so you have a language to describe the differences. Sure. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to you'd, sure. have, to, you'd have to add uh, conditionals based on the platform. Then you have to say if Windows do this, if Apple do this, okay. if Linux do that. You know. Um, yeah. Just a very simple question. I'm very lazy programmer. Okay. Um, and That's welcome nice. to the club. Yes. Um, I'll push my button for a week to save an hour. <laughs> yeah, we um, we all have that I, personality contact. If, if, if I configure the project, start working on it, I build it. I had a head of file. But does CMake actually understand the file dependencies in particular? You add a header file in what sense? Just to see your directory, or you? Uh, suppose that I add a MUC file. Do I have to reconfigure it? Or yes. Okay. You have to rebuild the same file. Now suppose well, I when you say when well, you say make C make will will reconfigure if it's needed. Yeah, so if it out. if you've added the source file, presumably you also edit a CMake list file and add a .c or .cxx file to that. And then if you type make, it will rerun CMake to do the configuration step again for you. Okay, so now I've added this new file. Mm -hmm. I'm developing it. I add a new head file that it depends on. Okay. Do I have to reconfigure it? Call it just no. CMake. <coughs> it will. It will rebuild. It will rebuild. Um, so then the question is, if you edit that header file, will it then rebuild correctly? Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes. But if it's not, then it's a bug. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's yes. I mean, <laughs> if it didn't work, then nobody could use this tool. Yeah. Yes, yes. that's right. Yes. That's yeah. Fundamental to the built system. So it is. Yes, it works. So, yeah. So that's quite interesting. You mentioned a, the CPT list. Are you applying a text file which which maintains the list of files that are in the No, CMake list is a it's a horrible legacy name that they have um, for for essentially their representation of the make file. Their high level yeah, the, the file that, level. Des that describes what's gonna happen is like our VM files. But the bottom line is to add a file, I have to actually go in and hand edit something. Yes. No, you can you can blob for them. Yeah. No, if you if you add a source file, you should edit a CMake list file. Okay. You, I mean, you don't have any uh, right. work on a system like this where we do the same thing. We produce Visual Studio files, we produce Xcode files, and everything. Mm -hmm. and we just ended up setting up that if you add a C file to a director you already have, it just added it. Yeah, yeah that's it yeah. Just took them, you know, everything in this directory we're building, unless you tell us not. Yeah. Sure. So, only add one that one. Well. So, so when you add a source file to a directory, what triggers a rebuild? Maybe. Yeah. So, you, you, so, you're, so you you would say your developers would have to explicitly run CMake after adding a source file. Yeah. Yeah. So well, yeah, we, we recommend that people right. edit the file, the CMake list file, and, edit, and add an entry there, so that when they just type make, it automatically does that. This just takes the editing step out. Yeah. So Essentially, what happens yeah. for us is that if the directory changes, yeah, it just it does a rescan of the directory. So you run make. If the directory changes, is that if the dates change or the Director is the parent to the parent of the parent. Okay. Then it simply rescans all of the directories to sure. find out as well. That makes sense. sense. Yes. So, just as a practical question, how does it scan for dependencies? Does it use the um, platform compiler, or do you have? Do you no, we have we have uh, custom code in CMake that scans for uh, C, C plus plus, and Fortran <coughs> uh, dependencies. Okay, so it uses Clang. No, no. It's just, it's just, it's just, not yet. Maybe later. Wait. Doug will, be, yeah. Doug will be calling you next week about that. <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt it. He's be on the phone to all the rest of us. Yes. If for some reason Kitware were to go away and get bought out or something, what happens to support for these tools? Or would we be left in the lurch? Or there? I, I, I'm not worried about Kitware going away. Um, they were founded in, in 1998. Um, it's 12 years later, we're about 70 people. I don't really see anybody buying us because, uh, well, we, we basically sell our time, right? So they'd be buying a set of employees is what they'd be buying. And, uh, you know, unless, unless there's a larger consulting company that wants to integrate what we do into their business, I don't see it really happening. Um, what I do see happening is, you know, it, it's been growing year over year for, for 12 years. 
Can you um, doing the same work for the whole bunch of other people that many of whom have money to pay for doing things like you know continuing development? So I mean, at least it it puts us in a much better boat than we are in now in terms of security, where if Vladimir goes away, you know that's it. We don't get any. Uh, you know, there's a couple of people who've been able to contribute patches and stuff to to his build, but nobody's going to be working on it for full time. Yeah. And how much of this is open source, such that everything that we do, well, nearly everything that we do is open source. I mean, we, we, we have some contracts that we get from clients where they say, you know, you're going to be working on this project for us, and it's, it's a, but all this, stuff, all this all stuff is open source. C makes C dash, uh, you should pay a curve, you might pay. Every, everything that's on these slides is open so source. If you're all on the what same license? plane and it crashed, we would still have the source. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's the license? Uh, uh, everything's, oh, uh, PSD style license. So it's, you know, uh, it's use it as is, do with it what you will. And uh, hire us to help you. <laughs> so that's all I've got. Um, if there's any other questions, I'll be in, you know, the, uh, what's it called? The Hefner Lounge? The Hefner Lounge. For, you know, the next half hour to an hour. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.